Welcome to this video in which I would like to present the results of a scenario analysis on the question what is required to reach the climate goals. Before I should start telling anything, I should say that this is only a short version of a longer video and if you would like to have the longer video, please watch that. Here I only summarize the main results, so this is more or less like an executive summary. I'm Andreas Fennig, I'm working at the University of Liège, I'm a chemical engineer and as chemical engineer I am applying balances to design processes and actually what I've done to derive this scenario analysis is apply the balances on global scale on global human processes. What I also should say, I used only data that are publicly available and you can go through them. They are mostly um, available by the United Nations. Energy statistics are available from different sources and those data have been used to perform this scenario analysis. Starting point for this entire consideration, these considerations was the result of the United Nations Climate Conference that took place at the end of 2015 in, Par 15 in Paris. There, many nations agreed on two goals. One wants to stay below two degrees with respect to the climate, the global climate, above the pre-industrial levels, and one wants to really take significant efforts to limit it even below 1.5 degrees centigrade, above pre-industrial levels. And if you look at that, of course, it's nice, it's a political goal. What does it mean for us? And for that, in order to answer that, to get some impression of that, what that actually means, I performed the scenario analysis, I set up the balances and saw what we have to do in order to achieve these goals. What do I have to take into account? Well, it's actually not that much. I have to take into account the world population, around 7 billion today, continually increasing. World population has certain demands with respect to energy, materials, as well as food. And these demands are supplied on the one hand side today from fossil resources as well as from the agricultural land area. Now, if you want to get rid of the fossil resources, because they are in the end producing the CO2 in the atmosphere, which creates the climate change, so you want to get rid of that, we have in the future to produce everything on the land area. Not necessarily only the agricultural area, because solar energy can be collected in deserts, for example, quite efficiently. So, but it nevertheless still relates to land area. Okay, and I depicted, so to speak, in a simulation these different influencing factors and looked what happens among, you know, in, within the interplay of these different factors. First thing is, of course, the world population. For the world population, there exist scenario calculations already by the United Nations, and they publish three different variants, a high variant, a medium variant, and a low variant. They don't specify any probability for them, and I, I wanted simply to know how likely are the different scenarios. And so what I did, I estimated, so to speak, from past data what would be expected for the future and I wind up with 10.5 billion in the year 2050. So that was a horizon of what I tried to understand a little bit better. And that means if that is a not unprobable value, that means that also the high variant is quite not unprobable that we will actually live according to that variant, which is of course quite, quite, quite negative because that means that the world population is continually increasing, which put, puts more and more pressure, increasing pressure on all the resources that we are using. So I did the scenario analysis with the high variant as my base case. The other variants of, are of course included as well for comparison, but I think that we will be living to, up to the high variant possibly. So it's a probable case. Now the question is, of course, this is a population. The question is, what is the effort that we have to take if you want to keep within the given climate limits? And this effort I want to express as the annual increase of renewables relative to the total primary energy consumption, which means how much of our fossil energy consumption do I want to replace by renewables per year? And this is 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, so corresponding fractions I want to replace. And once I have replaced them, of course, that will continue on. If I have built a photovoltaics, that will continue for the next year, so to speak. And the question is, well, how much effort do I have to put into that? How much fossil power plants and fossil energy-driven cars do I have to replace by 
renewable energy power plants and cars driven by renewable energies, just to give some examples, per year. And here we see that if you want to reach the 1.5 degrees centigrade goal with a high population scenario, we have to replace roughly 4% annually. Actually, that's where we are today. And we first have to increase the growth rate. Here it's increasing actually with 20% annually, 20% with respect to the renewable energies of the previous year. So that is, since that is still a small value, that can increase at this high rate. But at a certain limit, a certain year, we reach the absolute uh, limit, so to speak, where we replace too much of the primary energy. So here we are only replacing small fractions of the primary energy and here we are replacing now 4% of the fossil primary energy carriers by renewable energies. And that is, so to speak, the limit that determines the economy to a certain extent. It's a quite simplistic model, of course. In the end, the effort will increase if you want to replace the last fractions of the fossil energies, but just for simplicity to get some idea of the order of magnitude, I did that simulation. So here we have to replace 4% of the fossil energy power plants and cars annually by renewable corresponding equipment. If you want to achieve only 2%, uh, 2 degrees centigrade increase of climate, again with a high population scenario, that decreases to roughly 2%. So the effort is significantly less. We have to double the effort to get from the 2 degrees centigrade limit to the 1.5 degrees centigrade limit. On the other hand side, we see that for the 1.5 degrees centigrade limit, we have to uh, do that for a shorter time period. Here we end up at somewhere around 2050. So we have to keep that high level for some few decades. If you want to stick with a plus 2 degree centigrade limit, we have to keep up our efforts for quite extended period of time, something of the order of uh, 60 or so years. On the other hand side, if we shift from the high population scenario to the medium population scenario, there is again a significant decrease. We decrease the pressure on our resources if we limit the population growth uh, to the medium scenario, as is more or less expected, of course. Overall, the performance is similar between the uh, different scenarios, only the level is, so to speak, lower for the medium population scenario. Okay. This is energy and this I can tell you in principle it's possible to reach that but nevertheless the big numbers tell you it's a significant effort. Especially if you keep in mind that today we are replacing something of the order of less than half a percent annually. Now we want to shift that to 4% annually that we want to replace of the fossil resources by renewable resources. Well, I, I, I think it is possible in principle so we can manage that and but we see it's a quite significant effort that we have to keep up over an extended period of time. The second resource is the land area uh, that is used. Um, it's not just a fossil resource, also the land area. And here I sh show the land area by use in million square kilometers as a function of time. And we see the arable land, the pastures and meadows, meadows and the forests. So this is the agricultural land area and that is the forest. Of course, there's other land area available, deserts, permafrost regions and so on but that I didn't take into account because only these areas are those that are most likely to be used or that may be limiting factors, so to speak, as a resource for bioenergy production, for example, the, we have to cut the forests and things like that. Now we can look how that develops, the use of the land area develops in the future for the on one end side for the vegetal and the feed production. We need a certain land area. We need a certain land area for biofuels because we cannot replace all uh, of our energies that we are using by solar, by electricity, that doesn't work. Uh, we have to use biofuels for certain applications, driving planes, for example. And we need also things to produce biomaterials from, and that feed, feedstock is also bio, is uh, the only sustainable resource there is bio-based. That is, we have to use also land area to produce biomaterials. And if our food is coming, is animal-based, we also need a certain minimum land area for our animals and that is accounted here for here. And we see if we stick with the high population variant and the 1.5 degree centigrade goal, we have a problem somewhere in the year 2065 because there our agricultural land area is not sufficient anymore and we have to cut into the forests. 
that is of course not good because that means again problems with the climate, yeah, with our resources in principle. And actually one can say this increase here in the end rela relates directly to the high population variant to the continual increase of world population. So if we stick with the high population variant, even if you make slightly different assumptions and the levels may sh change a little bit, but you will always intersect that line, you will always have the problems perhaps 10 years later or so, but that is something of the order of magnitude you should expect as a change. On the other hand side, if we shift to the medium population variant, we see that we are able to manage with the currently available agricultural land area. So if we shift to medium population growth, fine, everything works out properly. These are some diagrams and now I want to show you some collected results, so to speak. I've shown that there are two limiting, two challenges that may be limiting, the climate uh, change and the energy use, the land area that is a limiting resource that we need for food, bioenergy and biomaterials production. We have to somehow solve both things to produce our energy sustainably and then do all the other things, the food, the bioenergy and so on, on the available land area. Significant drivers is the population growth, I have shown that. If we stick with the high population growth, we won't make it, so to speak, sooner or later. Uh, if, we stick, if we manage to uh, develop according to the medium population growth, everything works out fine. I have also shown in the longer version, not in the short version, that there is a decreased pressure on the land area if you shift from animal-based food to more uh, plant-based food. All this means in the end that there is a complete shift required in three major industries, the energy industry, agricultural industry and chemical industry and collected again the outcome of this scenario analysis with respect to climate. If we want to achieve the one plus 1.5 degrees centigrade goal, we have to replace 4% of the um, fossil energy consumption that we have by renewables per year for all years until the year 2055 roughly. At that high level for that period of time. If you want to achieve the plus 2 degrees centigrade goal, we have to somehow replace 2% fossils by renewables annually until the year 2090. Every year until 2090. Compare that to today, these values are around 0.25%. So it means we have to increase our efforts by a factor of 10 and more if you want to achieve the climate goals on a global scale. What are the conclusions? Well, first of all, the individual choices determine. Because, of course, the population growth does not simply happen. It's us who decide how many children we want to have, so it's us who have to limit the number of children. And one should put it very plainly. It's a little bit simplistic. I will mention that or explain that in, in the following, but to put it like that, since we have, since we know that every couple has two children, on the long term, on an intermediate term, we will um, have a constant population. It will not grow, it will not decrease, with uh, roughly two children per couple. That means every third child that is born will eat up that food and use those resources that are required by the first two children to survive sustainably. Third and further children. Of course it's too simplistic because there are sadly enough some couples that cannot have children, some people don't want to have children, so nevertheless, I can say that the trend, the overall perspective is some, some sort like that. And it's, of course, a very crude uh, assumption, so to speak, very um, simplistic. But nevertheless, I think the statement is clear. Yeah. Too many children eat up the food for the first children. Also, the animal-based nutrition increases pressure on the land area, so one should pre prefer plant-based versus animal nutrition. I myself am vegan, I don't propose that to you uh, necessarily, but keeping all these things in mind, perhaps you, next time you go to the supermarket, you have slightly different shifts in your choices. Of course, it's not only the individuals, it's also interactions between individuals that are important. We should support politics for the sustainable, even if the individual current benefits are limited. So if I earn a little bit less, but in say 20 to 30 years, which is the perspective, the horizon of all these developments, I will be better off with respect to climate and survival, or my children are better off in say 50 years from now, I should consider that. So my individual choices today and my political choices today influence how I will 
survive in the future. That also means that we have to develop societal values for sustainability because they do not really exist. Some, for some people they develop that, but not on the global average, so to speak. And one problem here is the human rights and the individual obligations. Today it's my right to decide how many children I want to have and what I want to eat. It's my choice, it's my human right here. But there doesn't exist any, and, and if somebody else then has to starve, and if my children have problems with the climate, I cannot, me, I cannot be taken responsible for that. I don't have any obligations with respect to other people and with respect to my children in that context. Simply because we don't have that link that actually exists in every national law. If I have the right, right of way on the road, the other person has to stop and vice versa. And something like that is missing on this level. Of course, there are also some general aspects to be mentioned here. One should strongly support the energy change away from fossil towards renewable energies and of course uh, support energy savings because then that can reduce the pressure by some 10 or 20 percent as well. In the longer version it has worked out that the bioenergy can only be some intermediate solution because it puts additional pressure on the land area for the food production. And something I should mention, I cannot mention often enough actually, everything will happen within our lifetime. We should be really get starting now because within five to ten years we have to really have reached the maximum change rate, so to speak. And we have to keep that up for the next decades continually if we want to save the climate. And that is really the, our own lifetime and that of our children for what that is important. Because, as we have seen for the uh, climate, that will increase beyond the plus 2 degrees centigrade if we don't succeed in that within some few decades. And for the land area, that means the food production within the next, say, 50 years or so, which is our children's time. With that, I, th I hope I have given you some insight here in this presentation, only in the short version. I would be happy if you would uh, also have a look at the longer version if you're interested in the topic and I hope that this is beneficial for you and uh, these insights that you gained and uh, well I can only hope hopefully together with you that we will manage to solve the challenges ahead. Thank you very much.